So just as we get started this morning, uh, would somebody like to uh, just give us a recap uh, summary of what we've said that our definition of the conscience is from the last few weeks from the book? Anybody want to offer that up? Oh, that's good. That's multiple components, right? It's a gift from God. Uh, God is the Lord of the conscience. He's given us the conscience to help us make decisions, and it's especially helpful in those areas that are um, maybe, you know, we can't point to a verse in Scripture and say word for word, you know, God addresses this, but he's given us a conscience. Um, God's moral law has been imprinted on our hearts uh, so that even though it is flawed, it's not infallible, we do have a, a general sense of, of God's holiness and God's moral law imprinted on us so that we can, can make decisions. And just a quote from the book directly, uh, they said, Crowley and Nicelli said that the conscience is your consciousness of what you believe is right and wrong. Your consciousness of what you believe is right and wrong uh, at any given point in time. And last week, uh, just helpful just to recap a little bit, we did think about how you know, the conscience is what we believe is right or wrong at any given point in time. And as we grow in our uh, relationship with Christ, our walk with Christ, our knowledge of God and his laws is often going to outpace our obedience to him. Right? And the goal is that, that both would be increasing, uh, but they're likely not going to increase at the same rate. And so our struggle with sin is going to be continuous. We're not going to reach this place where we can just get rid of the conscience altogether and our, our processing of what is right and wrong in these decisions that we have to make. Uh, but, but it's God's grace that we lean on in humility as we, we work through those things. And uh, we're going to reference, I wanted to throw it up here because it's not on the PowerPoint, but we're going to go back to uh, this illustration today. We're thinking about God's will and our conscience and the, the degree of overlap there or not. Because this morning in chapter 4, we're going to be talking about how do we, how should we calibrate our conscience. And last week we talked about uh, what do we do if our, how do we respond to our conscience if our conscience is condemning us rightly. How do we uh, appropriately respond to that, to that leading from our, from our conscience in concert with the Holy Spirit uh, but this morning, we're going to be looking at what do we do, uh, how do we think through, how do we evaluate when our uh, conscious, con conscience might be uh, condemning us wrongly. And this is the language that they use in the book of calibrating and, and adjusting our, our conscience. And so just a little bit more of a recap. Uh, we said that we should seek to have a good conscience. That's you know, used in a lot of different phrases and seen in many different places in Scripture. Our goal should be, uh, in a sense, to be at peace with our conscience uh, if it is in line with God's moral law, if it is in line with God's revealed will uh, in, in Scripture. Uh, because as we said, for instance, from Romans 2, God's law is written on our hearts. And then in Romans 14, which we're going to look at more specifically this morning, uh, Paul tells us there, Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So we should seek to have a good conscience, acting in faith uh, to the glory of God. And there are going to be times when acting in accordance with our conscience is going to result in loss. That we're going to have to suffer uh, for the sake of having a good conscience, having a clear conscience, as Paul often says, before God. Uh, and this, this is going to be the case for all of us, and increasingly so. There's going to be times where our conscience is going to forbid us from doing certain things, or our conscience is going to demand certain things of us that are going to be in conflict with the, the broader culture or the broader structures that we find ourselves in. So what are we going to do when our employer demands that we affirm something explicitly that, that we cannot affirm? Are we prepared to suffer for the sake of a clean and clear conscience before God? I think a really good example of this, you can think back to 2014 and the, uh, it's fine. No, you're fine. Think back to, think back to 2014 and the example with uh, Hobby Lobby. Does anyone remember the Supreme Court case uh, where under uh, the health care guidelines of, under Obamacare was prescribed that they would offer 
contraceptives to all of their employees uh, under their, by, you know, through their own dime. And Hobby Lobby, as a piece of conscience, as a, an item of conscience, they said that they, they cannot do that. Uh, and they were going to be forced to pay millions and millions of dollars in fines. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, right? And, and, and the Supreme Court granted in their favor. But that's not always going to be the case. Uh, there's going to be times where we are going to have to suffer for conscience's sake. And our goal has to be that our conscience would be in line with the Word of God because it would be an incredible shame to suffer for the sake of a clean conscience and our conscience to be mistaken. So we have to be actively be working through, processing, and evaluating, does our conscience line up uh, with, with God's will? And I think a great line uh, that's quoted in this regard in the book uh, is uh, back in, in the beginnings of the Reformation with Martin Luther, as he was standing uh, before the church in regards to his affirmation of the doctrine of, of salvation by faith alone. And uh, he was facing... Uh, punishment uh, for that. And he said, I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And that's a, that's a good reminder for us. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe, but we need to make sure that our conscience is in line with the Word of God. And this morning, we're going to be talking about these instances where our conscience may be burdened by something, but it's, it's, uh, it's out here. And maybe even those instances where our conscience was burdened about something that is, exp- is not in line with God's will. And so how do we respond to those instances? How do we calibrate our conscience so that we can, we can move this triangle, in a sense, to be in line with God's will and to leave these other issues uh, to the side? How should we calibrate our conscience? And just as a reminder this morning, uh, as we talked about earlier, we have to ask the question, should we listen to our conscience? We talked about this uh, every week, the last couple of weeks. From Scripture, should we listen to our conscience? And we said that, yes, we should. Uh, the, the phrase that they use in the book is, we should generally, always listen to our conscience, which is really helpful, and then you start thinking about it. It's like, well, is that really helpful? We should generally, always listen to our conscience? I think it is, and we said that, Ignoring our conscience, sinning against it, is, is a matter of life and death uh, because that can lead to um, a hardening of your heart uh, towards God, an acceptance of sin, and eventually the, you know, the fear of, ultimately, having a, a seared conscience before God where we can, we can sin and have no prick of, of, the, of the conscience. And uh, I want to read to you a quote from in the book. Um, it's, they're referencing... Uh, John MacArthur's book that he wrote on the conscience several years ago, and it speaks of, you know, why we should listen to our conscience. And it's an instance from 1984 and an airline, uh, a passenger plane that crashed in Spain in 1984. Uh, And this is what he said. He said, in 1984, an Avianca Airlines jet crashed in Spain, and investigators studying the accident made an eerie discovery. The black box of the cockpit uh, recorders revealed that several minutes before the impact, a shrill computer-synthesized voice from the plane's automatic warning system told the crew repeatedly in English, pull up, pull up, pull up. And they could hear from the black box. The pilot, thinking that the system was malfunctioning, told the system to shut up, and he switched the system off. And minutes later, the plane plowed into the side of a mountain, and everyone on board died. So when I saw that tragic story on the news shortly after, it struck me as a perfect parable of the way that modern people treat the warning messages of their consciences. The wisdom of our age says guilty feelings are nearly always erroneous or hurtful, and therefore we should switch them off. And the conscience is generally seen by the modern world as a defect that robs people of their self-esteem. But far from being a defect or a disorder, however, our ability to sense our own guilt is a tremendous gift from God. God's designed our consciences so that we would hear that warning of of pull up when we're entering those areas that are outside of God's will. And so we should generally always listen to our conscience. But again, we need to be reminded that our conscience and God's will does not perfectly line up. It's not infallible. And so 
We must inform it uh, through the Word of God, by the will of God. We're going to talk about uh, informing it by truth, primarily God's truth, uh, but also truth that is outside of Scripture, which, of course, is also God's truth, but not revealed in the same way. How can we inform our conscience? And living, living according to God's will uh, is the standard. So we need to, need to ask how reliable is our conscience at any given point on any specific issue, on any number of issues, how reliable is our conscience. So if you would, uh, turn to Romans 14. We're going to read through Romans chapter 14 together. And Paul gives us a really good example of evaluating different levels of, of conscience, uh, where, our, where we're at in regards to being theologically informed and how that is helpful for us today to think about where we're at and also how we're to relate to our brothers and sisters that may be in a different place than we are in terms of being theologically informed on certain issues. But before we read Romans 14, does anybody have any questions? Anything we want to catch up on, reevaluate before we move, move ahead? No? Okay. I'm going to read Romans 14. And I'm actually going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll... Uh, We'll break it down and, and focus in on a few things. So Romans 14. Paul says there, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who who eats, for God has accepted him. And who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. And he who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in, it, in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. So Paul gives us a really helpful paradigm here for thinking through what are we to do uh, when brothers and sisters in the church disagree on different things as a matter of conscience. How are we to think through... Um, Think through those positions and, and to give them, give them labels in a sense of how we're to look at them. And, and I do want to point out before we continue, um, verse 
22. He says, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. And you could take that verse to mean a lot of things, right? But clearly, we're, we're talking about issues here that we have to wrestle through together uh, from the will of God. Paul is not saying, whatever you want to do, as long as you're convinced of it, you know, praise God, you know, you're good, right? You know, the ultimate arbiter is not our conscience. The ultimate arbiter is God's will, but he has given us our conscience to, to think through these things. So we're going to look at, we're going to break down these different groups of people uh, that Paul is speaking about here in, in Romans 14. And he alludes to, you know, different stages of being theologically informed about certain issues. And what we mean by theologically informed is being versed in the Word of God and applying the principles of truth that we see in God's Word to a, to a wide degree of, of different issues. And uh, the degree in which those beliefs, that theological information, affects the believer in, in a range of circumstances and issues. So there's, there's three issues primarily that Paul is talking about here in Romans 14, which you can see here uh, in regards to food, in regards to holy days, and in regards to wine. Those are the three issues that he's addressing, and we can take these and apply to, to a range of different issues. Um, but what does Paul do here? So he gives, and he, he gives these labels of two different kinds of people. There are those who are strong, and in regards to these issues, uh, they're able to say, I can eat all kinds of food. You know, thinking about the other instance in, in 1 Corinthians, those, those individuals can say, I can eat the meat, uh, without asking if it's sacrificed to idols in good conscience, and I can enjoy that to the glory of God. Just another example that we see. And so in regards to holy days, the strong, as Paul calls them, it makes no distinction between the days. They live before God, glorify God in every day, see every day alike, uh, and that's, that's how they live. And also in regards to wine, the strong uh, drink wine, and they do it to the glory of God in good conscience. Those are the strong uh, in Romans 14. And then he speaks about the weak. And you can, you can notice the difference here. So the weak eats only vegetables. Uh, they, they abstain from meat altogether because they are concerned about uh, the source of that meat or, or whatever their view may be of it. That in some way they think eating that meat is dishonoring to God and is wrong for them. So they eat only vegetables. In regards to holy days, they, they see some days as more valuable than others. And they believe that on certain days they have to honor God in a certain way, observe certain things. And in regards to wine, they abstain from wine altogether uh, to, the, to God's glory because they believe that it is best for them to do that uh, to be in good conscience. So let's, let's think through Paul's, uh, the way in which he describes all of these, these issues and these characters. And I think it's important for us to recognize first one thing, or two things that Paul uh, does not do. And maybe I'll just open it up here first. What does Paul not say in regards to the strong in Romans 14? What are some things that maybe we expect him to say that are, that are missing from his discussion here? Yeah, absolutely. Right, so Paul doesn't say, now you strong, you guys, you all are the leaders in your church, you are, you are prime examples of Christians, right? He doesn't say that, he doesn't make that sort of a judgment on the strong. He doesn't, he doesn't praise them for their you know, wonderful insight in their ability to please God, right? Okay. Maybe the flip side of that, uh, what does Paul not say in regards to the weak? Fleshing that out a little bit more. Right? Yeah, same thing, right? He doesn't pass judgment on the weak. He doesn't, he doesn't condemn them for their acts of conscience on any of these issues, right? All the same. Uh, he doesn't condemn them. He, he doesn't tell them that they're in sin, and he doesn't tell them to, to get their act together and strive to be like the strong necessarily uh, to the point of so that they're um, able to be uh, more pleasing to God. He doesn't pass that judgment on them. Which is even more difficult because he's included himself in the strong. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So he identifies himself of where he's at, but he doesn't pass judgment uh, on those who he would say are weak. Okay. So let's think through here. So what... What, what does Paul do by the way he discusses these issues? So he, he demonstrates that this whole spectrum of positions can be held among believers uh, as long as it is done 
in faith and in good conscience to the Lord. He doesn't condemn, he doesn't condemn either camp on these issues. He says that these can be held among believers and they can disagree on these things as long as it's done in faith. Right? He says at the end, verse 23, whatever is not done from faith is in sin. So if the individual is holding these positions in faith before God, he doesn't condemn them for being in sin. And, so, and then he instructs the believers to, to love each other, to not let these issues be, uh, be areas where they allow them to become divisive and call each other out and accuse, uh, but to love each other, uh, understanding that we're all seeking to live according uh, to God's will. We're all seeking to live for God's, for God's glory uh, in these areas. So the question is, if Paul's not condemning, if he's not... Um, commending in, a, in an ultimate sense. You know, he is, he is commending. He says himself that he's among the strong, in a sense. What is Paul advocating and arguing for here in Romans 14? Well, I think we can say that he's arguing for a theologically informed conscience that is gracious and other-centered. A theologically informed conscience that is gracious and other-centered. So, when Paul calls these believers strong in comparison to those who he calls weak. What's the difference? Paul's acknowledging by his own, own example that there is a difference of understanding theologically. There are different theological principles, uh, more mature theological principles that are being put in place by the strong uh, in, in comparison to the weak. And so what, what, what's an example of that here? So the, the, strong, the weak say, I can, I can only eat vegetables, I have to abstain from this meat uh, because it, we can say, you know, it might have been sacrificed to idols. And, and of course, idols are opposed to God, and therefore I need to abstain from all meat. I need to completely abstain to God's glory. And Paul would say, okay, the heart there is seeking God's glory, and that's commendable. It's done in faith. But what does he say about himself? Verse 14, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So the weak, Paul says, I should not press that brother or sister to eat meat in his current state of conscience because to him it is unclean. And in violating his conscience, that would be sin. Uh, but for Paul, and for those he labels as, as strong, he says, I understand that all, you know, all things are God's. You know, God is not weakened by idols and whatsoever, and I don't have to ask if this meat has been sacrificed to idols, but in good conscience, I can eat this meat to God's glory, disregarding the pagan worship, and, and, and I can do that. And I think also it's helpful for us, you know, when he says weak and strong, we do need to remind ourselves, again, that, that Paul is, is not condemning. He is praising. He is, he is encouraging, in a sense, for all of us to seek to be strong, but it's not an issue of how much one can, can please God or be in good standing before God. It's, it's an encouragement to grow in theological maturity and understanding, which, of course, is, is pleasing to God. So he's advocating for a theologically informed conscience that is gracious and uh, others-centered. And so we also should seek to be strong in our consciences as we grow in Christ, as we grow in theological understanding, um, because the weak are not heretical, the weak are not stupid. It's just showing an, a progressing in theological understanding, a progression in maturity before God, and applying those, those principles. And so, how do we grow? How do we get from being weak in certain areas, in certain understanding, in certain application of theological principles on a variety of issues? How do we grow to being strong? How do we calibrate our conscience according to God's revealed will uh, so that we can apply the theological principles that we see in God's Word? That's where we're going next. I want to stop there. Anything, anything from the table or Romans 14 that you want to... Yeah, and that's a good thing for us to point out, right? And that's, that's what Paul is, that's what Paul is uh, trying to keep the church in Rome and also us today from from getting to, right? Allowing these things that are not ultimate to become ultimate issues. Uh, and of course, there is going to be 
be friction, but, you know, right? How can, how can we demonstrate love that Paul is advocating for unless we're in those friction-causing situations? Right? I mean, that's where, we, that's where we demonstrate that, you know, I, I hold this in clear conscience, you hold that in clear conscience, let's grow together, let's seek God's will. Uh, but we have to, in love, keep these things from dividing us, ultimately. And that demands, you know, an acknowledgement of disagreement and, and growth together. Yeah. Absolutely. And the gospel, yeah, the gospel absolutely informs the way that we work through these issues together. And the gospel keeps us from saying, you know what, brother, you're just, you're just really weak. You know, you need to, in a demeaning way, right? You're really weak. You need to grow. You're just, you're really confused on this issue. You know, the gospel informs how we grow together in grace. We're all at different levels of maturity. We're all working through these issues when you keep the gospel, gospel central and, and uh, do that in a way keep a clean conscience, clear conscience before God in a way that's gracious and concerned more with our brothers and sisters than than with ourselves. Good. Okay. All right, we're going to keep moving here. So the big question is, how do we work through these issues? How do we, the language they use, how do we calibrate our conscience on those issues where our conscience is... Our conscience condemns us for certain things, and we're going to work. We're going to talk about some contemporary issues, um, at least plant seeds so you can think through these things. Um, how do we calibrate our conscience so that on these issues where our conscience condemns us, and we come to the conclusion that it shouldn't, we grow in theological maturity. How do we adjust our conscience to be in line with the Word of God? in a way that is not disregarding our conscience. And that's, that's, the, that's the careful line that we have to walk. Paul is urging us towards theological maturity, but the way to theological maturity on certain issues is not just to say, conscience, you're wrong. No matter what you tell me, I'm just going to march on and do this. The way that Paul is urging is to grow in maturity, adjusting our conscience on these issues by God's truth, so that we can think and believe rightly uh, in a way that's pleasing to God. So how do we calibrate our conscience? And the goal is to be burdened about the right things before God and not to be burdened about the wrong, the wrong things. And we use the, the language of, of calibration. Uh, you know, I think that's, I see that as a technical term, right? You, you calibrate an instrument uh, before you use it, so to ensure that it's accurate. Uh, this last yesterday, my family was making uh, sorghum syrup, making molasses, and we have an, uh, an instrument when we're cooking that syrup that tests the percent sugar as it's as it's heating up, as it's uh, as it's transforming itself into syrup. The percent sugar is going up. We have an instrument; it's called a refractometer, and to use that instrument. Uh, in candy making or in whatever, you have to you have to zero it out. You have to calibrate it. You have to allow it to test pure water and see that it is 0% sugar before you can test whatever you're actually trying to evaluate so that it, it, it uh, works accurately. That's calibration. You have to zero it out. You have to make sure that it is functioning accurately. Or you could also think about this, uh, if you're more inclined to, think about um, cultivating our conscience. You think about a, a garden uh, or a, a, a field that you're growing a crop in. You don't just plant the seed and run away and come back three months later and see what's happened, right? You cultivate the garden. You remove weeds. You add in things that are going to be helpful to the plant for it to, to grow um, so, that it can, so that it can succeed and it can grow effectively. So what are some reasons that our conscience may change over time? If we're going to talk about calibrating, adjusting, shifting our conscience, what are some reasons that it may change over time? Well, the first two of these are obviously negative, but we need to acknowledge these because our sin, our conscience can not only be adjusted positively, it can also be adjusted negatively, and we have to be aware of that. First, our conscience may change because of the, the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, in some areas, we may be gradually ignoring our conscience, suppressing our conscience, those, those pricks of guilt, uh, because we believe something to be wrong at a current time. We're ignoring that. We're being deceived by sin, and our conscience is being uh, calibrated, but it's being calibrated contrary to the Word of God and being deceived by sin. 
Another, another example, you know, a reason our conscience might change is that we might be conforming to the standards of other people. We might just be going with the flow, with our broader culture, with our family, with our work context, you know, whatever influences, friends, it could be in any number of things, areas where you're being influenced by other people, and because of that influence, uh, we're adjusting our conscience, but it's not in the direction of God's will and his word. And lastly, the third reason our conscience may change, uh, this is the goal, this is where we want to be, is that we are conforming to the truth, that we're being conformed, growing in line with the truth in response to, uh, in response to God's word. So what is the difference? Uh, if we're going to walk this fine line, what is the difference between calibrating our conscience and sinning against it? So we talked about suppressing our conscience. Now we're going to talk about calibrating our conscience. Anybody want to offer up how you might think through that? How do we know when we're calibrating our conscience faithfully? And how do we know when we're suppressing our conscience sinfully? Absolutely. right. So you, you know... You believe this certain thing and you know it's in line with God's word and you go against it. You're sinning against your conscience. Okay, anybody else? Difference between calibrating and and sinning against our conscience? Right, yeah, if you're only taking in truth or what you think is truth outside of God's word and using that to inform your conscience, then absolutely be sinning against your conscience. All right, so the goal here, as, as they say in the book, is to train and edu- educate our conscience so that we not sin against it, but put it under the lordship of Christ. That's the goal in calibrating, is to put it under the lordship of Christ. And, and I want us to think about an example here, uh, just a hopefully relatively you know, uh, easy example in our eyes, but it may not be, and that's okay. So think about Brian. Brian's an individual uh, that we know, and Brian grew up in a household that said that uh, it was a sin to drink root beer, that it was, it was a sin against God to drink root beer. And so Brian, uh, Brian grows up, uh, and he, he uh, gets married, he has a family, and Brian's wife did not grow up with that same conviction uh, that drinking root beer is a sin, not an, er- not an issue of conscience for her. And uh, so one day, they're, they're watching a football game together, Brian's wife brings him a root beer, uh, so they can enjoy that while they're watching the game. And Brian's conscience is, is at issue with that. And Brian starts to think about that. And he believes, he uh, is processing through that belief that he had growing up and was instilled in him that, that, that root beer, uh, it's not a sin to drink root beer. It's not wrong to do that before God. So what does Brian do in that moment? Well, there's two, there's two options that Brian can do. He can either dismiss his conscience saying, well, that's just, that's just ridiculous. He can dismiss his conscience and chug the root beer as quickly as he can and enjoy it. Or he can process through and theologically inform himself specifically and think through why is it that it is not wrong before God for me to drink this root beer. And that's the difference. That's the difference between calibrating and sinning against. Uh, if Brian jumps headlong without processing through and ignores his conscience, uh, he is, he's doing damage to his soul. But calibrating, Brian is thinking through specifically, why is it theologically uh, that it's okay and not wrong for me to drink this root beer and to have that conviction uh, before God? So the difference here, as we see in Brian's case, the difference between sinning against our conscience, we're sinning against our conscience if we believe that our conscience is right and we ignore it anyway. So again, and this word, the, the belief there is critical, and especially for me, because I think coming into this class, my understanding of conscience is just whatever feeling comes to the top when I'm thinking through an issue. But if we believe that our conscience is correct and we ignore it, then we're sinning against our conscience. So uh, Brian, like we said, he just dives in, drinks the root beer, ignores his conscience, and moves on. But calibrating our conscience, the difference is that the Lord has taught us through our intake of his word, through being with the people of God, the Lord has taught our conscience that uh, we can believe this certain warning uh, to be unnecessary and to determine that our conscience needs to be adjusted to be more compatible, more in line, more informed by uh, the will of God. 
And uh, Chris has referenced often this quote from Mark Dever that's in the book where he says that, that conscience cannot make a wrong thing right. And we understand that, that we can, we can sin in good conscience, but that doesn't make the sin right. Uh, but conscience can make a right thing wrong. So if Brian is, is convicted and he does believe that drinking that root beer is, is a sin against God and he drinks that root beer, for him it is a sin. So conscience cannot make a wrong thing right, but it can make a right thing wrong. Can anybody think from Scripture an example uh, where someone in Scripture had to calibrate their conscience? Can anyone think of an example just off the top of your mind? We're going to look at one together. but Examples in Scripture where someone had to calibrate and adjust their conscience to be in line with God's will. Peter? Yeah, that's what we're going to look at. A specific example from Peter? Yeah, and this is why I love Peter, right? I mean, you look at Peter in the Gospels, and he just, especially in uh, Matthew 16, right? He makes this confession of Christ, turns around, and Jesus is calling him Satan, right? He just he shows this, this spectrum of just unbelievable uh, insight by God's grace and then falling into sin, and, and I think that's us. So this is why I love Peter. Peter grows in his conscience in Acts 10, and then in Galatians 2, Paul is condemning him because he's gone against his conscience again. So we're going to look at this together. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. Look at this example of Peter. And would somebody mind reading that for us? Uh, chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, and then jump down and read verse 28. So 9 through 16 and then 28. Good. All right, so this is what Nacelli and Crowley says about, about this instance in Peter's life. They say, clearly, Peter's faith in Christ was not weak. He was an apostle who understood and believed the gospel. And thousands had converted under his preaching, and he had even suffered for the gospel. Yet, when it came to eating unclean animals and fellowshipping with Gentiles, Peter's faith was still very weak indeed, in the sense that he lacked confidence to do these things. I think that's a really good description. Peter's faith was still very weak in the sense that he lacked confidence to do these things that were, that were now right for him. But because Christ himself was commanding him, he had to calibrate his conscience so that he would have the faith, the confidence, to accept food and people that he was previously not able to accept. So what's happening in Peter's life? In the, under, Peter is now under the, the new covenant. He is, he's followed Jesus, and he's now an apostle in the church, the early church, proclaiming the gospel. But Peter is still allowing his conscience to be burdened by that which it should not be burdened in any longer. Peter is still living under old covenant issues when he is in the new covenant under Christ. And he is forced by God's grace and Jesus' command of him here to calibrate his conscience, to adjust his conference, his conference, his conscience, so that he might proclaim the gospel to Cornelius uh, and his family. So he has to adjust his conscience now where he can say, under the new covenant, uh, in faithfulness to Christ, I can fellowship with Gentiles, I can eat with Gentiles, I can eat what I previously knew to be unclean food, uh, and that is to God's glory because of the theological truth, the belief that Peter now understood by God's grace that he was no longer under the old covenant, but he was in Christ under the new covenant. That's what Peter had to go through here in Acts chapter 10. So how do we do the same thing? How do we calibrate our conscience to be in line, more in line with God's will? Two things. How do we calibrate your conscience? First, we calibrate our conscience by educating it with truth. We calibrate our conscience by educating it with truth. I'm going to read a, a quote again from John MacArthur's book. He puts it this way. The conscience reacts to the convictions of the mind and therefore can be encouraged and sharpened in accordance with God's word. That's, I'm going to read that again. The conscience reacts to the convictions of the mind. So that's the, the belief about what is right and wrong. And therefore can be encouraged and sharpened in accordance with God's word. The wise Christian wants to master biblical truth so that the conscience is completely informed and judges right because it is responding to God's word. A regular diet of scripture will strengthen a weak conscience or restrain an overactive one. Conversely, Error 
Human wisdom and wrong moral influences filling the mind will corrupt or cripple the conscience. In other words, the conscience functions like a skylight, not a light bulb. It lets light into the soul. It does not produce its own. Its effectiveness is determined by the amount of pure light we expose it to and how clean we keep it. Cover it or put it in total darkness and it ceases to function. So we calibrate our conscience not by the influences of those around us unless those individuals are soaked in God's word and and in the community of faith. But primarily we calibrate our conscience by educating it with, with truth. And they make the distinction here in the book but by between two kinds of truth, in a sense. You know, first and foremost, we need to be soaked in Scripture. We need to be educating our conscience, educating our souls from truth that is inside the Bible, what God has revealed to us in His Word. We need to be so soaked in Scripture. As, as MacArthur says, we need to be uh, masters of biblical truth so that we can apply those principles uh, in calibrating our conscience. We educate our conscience with truth from inside the Bible, but also we need to educate our conscience with truth from outside the Bible. And when we say that, we're not saying there's there's this truth that God tells us and then there's all this other truth in the world that we need to discover apart from God. No, there's truth in God's Word and there's truth in the world. Uh, They don't conflict. All truth is God's truth. But we need to be processing both even though uh, receiving truth from Scripture is primary. What's an example of this? Let's say... Uh, that your conscience is, there's an there's a individual in the church uh, that says that your conscience, his conscience is rightly informed by scripture that stealing is wrong. So he has read God's word, he understands that, he believes that, and in that instance his conscience is in line with God's will. And he affirms that stealing is indeed wrong. So he believes God's truth in that. But let's say that he, he owns a, a business and he hires a new accountant to help him in that business, in his business practices. And this accountant who really knows tax law and understands what they're doing uh, to, to a fault suggests a new way of, of adjusting those accounts so that this individual uh, can pay less taxes and keep more money for themselves from, from the year. And, and that sounds great. And he says, all for it. Great, you're an accountant. I'm glad you know what you're doing. I don't know anything about taxes. I'll let you do your thing. Help me pay less taxes to the government at the end of the year. And so this individual uh, comes, and let's say he finds Kara Hutcherson. And he's explaining, Kara, this is what my new accountant is helping me do, and I'm going to pay less taxes. This is going to be a great year. It's going to be awesome. And he's explaining all of these things that the accountant described to him. And Kara says, yeah, that does sound great, but unfortunately, that's tax fraud. Whatever he's explained, whatever he's told you he's going to do, you don't understand it, but that's actually tax fraud. And uh, if you get audited, you're going to go to jail. And that's what Kara tells him. So what happened there? That, this individual, their, understand, their misunderstanding, not of the truth in God's word, but the truth in the world, the lack of understanding of tax law led them to proceed into this instance uh, that, is, that is actually stealing, that is, that is contrary to God's word. But now, now that this individual, now that he understands truth outside of God's word, he understands tax law better, he can say rightly, no, that's actually stealing. And I didn't recognize that before because I didn't understand that this was tax fraud that this accountant was describing. But no, now that I understand it, from my understanding of truth outside of of God's word, I can apply the truth from God's word and say, no, that's stealing, and and, uh, I'm not going to do that. Does that make sense? Any questions on on that distinction, truth inside the word and outside of the word? Okay, another example of this that is, uh, you know, extremely um, pressing over the last few decades especially is... You know, learning, uh, learning that a, uh, a type of b- birth control, contraceptive, is actually an abortifacient, is actually causing uh, abortions um, to, to, that, uh, to the pregnant mother. And learning that, uh, coming to understand that truth, that scientific understanding, uh, allows that individual to, uh, to apply God's word and say, no, that's, that's, that's sin. And, and my conscience should be burdened by that even though it wasn't before because I didn't understand what was actually going on. That's a, that's a bigger issue that we can, we can uh, see that playing out in. Okay, so not only do we need to educate our conscience with truth, uh, 
but we also need to calibrate it with due process. We need to calibrate our conscience with due process. And what do we mean by this? Well, we need to recognize and understand that it, it, it may take us a long time to work through uh, these issues as we're being informed by God's word, applying those principles to issues in our lives, things that we are burdened, that our conscience is burdened about or, or not. It's going to take us a long time to think through and rightly apply God's word and for our conscience to respond to that direction appropriately. And, and again, an example of this is, is Peter, right? He came to understand and believe and calibrate his conscience to act appropriately here in Acts 10. But if you read, if you read Galatians 2... What does Paul do? Paul condemns Peter because when Jews arrive in their, in their gathering, Peter quits eating with Gentiles. And he, it says he fears the circumcision party and he falls back into that practice of being burdened by the old covenant law when he shouldn't be. So we just need to recognize that we're going to have to work through these issues over time to calibrate our conscience with due process uh, so that we can so that we can act in clear conscience in a way that's in line with God's will. Thinking back to Brian, it may take Brian months to preach the truth to himself and tell his soul, tell his conscience that according to these principles, it is not wrong for him to drink root beer, and he needs to give himself time to work through that, to be to allow his conscience to become clear before God in that issue, uh, as he applies those truths to himself. And so this is. This is an issue of wisdom. You know, we should generally always listen to our conscience. It can accuse us wrongly. We need to apply God's truth to it and, and not ignore it, but do calibrate it uh, to God's glory. And so lastly, just as we wrap up, um, I just want to bring up a couple issues that they describe in the book. Um, and if you have the book, uh, or if you don't have the book, I'd really encourage you to get it uh, even just for this section because uh, they, they go into specific issues and talk about how we, need, how we may need to calibrate or adjust our conscience on just examples of contemporary issues that, that we need to think about. And, uh, and to do that, they describe two different prongs of the issue. You know, there's issues where we need to add to our conscience. And by that, it means that in our lives, we may recognize that we are not burdened about certain issues uh, that we should be. And so we, as we grow in theological understanding, we need to apply that truth, add those burdens to our conscience that, that aren't there. So that's these issues, that's these issues out here. That's when we need to add to our conscience. But also there are times when we need to uh, take away from our conscience. We need to, um, there, we may be burdened about certain things that we shouldn't be, and we need to subtract from our conscience uh, in that way. So, as I bring up a few of these issues, you know, these are examples of, uh, of thinking through issues, and we need to, you know, commit to show each other grace and as we work through this process. So I'm just going to read a couple from the book and, and show how Crowley and, and Nacelli think through these issues. So first, examples where we might need to calibrate our conscience by adding to it. And the first one, uh, if you're following along, page 70, the first one issue they raised is... Should we view, should you view, sexually charged nudity in videos? So not necessarily thinking about explicit pornography, but just film, TV shows. Should you view sexually charged nudity in videos? And, and I think it's fair to say that you know, many of us are, are not as burdened about that as we should be. As we should be, and you know, some can, and we can make arguments to say that you know, in certain instances, it's uh, it's it's appropriate and it's it's fine. People make those arguments, um, but um, I think along with Crowley and Nacelli here, we need to recognize that we are likely not as burdened about that issue in in the films that we watch, the TV shows that we take in. We likely need to add a burden to our conscience to be uh, to be more. Um, rightly responding to, to God's will in that issue. So another, another one that they, read, uh, they raise, how far is too far in a dating relationship, right? And if you've, uh, we were all teenagers once, uh, if you've worked with the youth group at all, right, this is a question all the time, right? How far is too far in a dating relationship? 
uh, where, where's the line in a dating relationship? And uh, you know, asking that question even points out that, that we're seeking to go against our conscience, right? Where is the line that I can get up to and not cross? How far can I transgress, in a sense, and not be burdened about it? We've all worked through that issue at some point or another. And so they say, you know, they say this is probably an issue uh, in, in ourselves, in our teaching, um, even thinking about our own past, where we need to make sure that we are adding burden to our conscience because of the truth that we all believe, that, uh, that God's Word teaches that, that the sexual union is reserved to the marriage relationship of a man and a woman. And so we need to apply that principle to, to add a burden to our conscience, to reserve, uh, to reserve even those non, non-sexual acts, that we may call them non-sexual acts, that they really are, to reserve those things for marriage and to preserve ourselves and add burden to our conscience in that, that area. Uh, another one that he raises, you know, should I spend a lot of time, an excessive amount of time on sports? Uh, the, uh, the author talks about his own experience with this, where he grew up in a household that prioritized sports to the max and playing sports constantly, watching sports constantly, being, uh, being absorbed in sports, you know, monitoring them, uh, watching them all the time. And he says, well, I, I came to the conclusion that in light of God's instruction to make the most of my time, to not waste my time, I needed to add a burden to my conscience to recognize that I should be burdened to not waste so much time on, on non-ultimate things. Not that I need to get rid of sports altogether, but I need to make sure that I'm spending my time in, in kingdom-glorifying ways. And so uh, Crowley talks about there adding to his conscience. So those are a few examples of adding burdens to our conscience. Any, any question there or any way we need to think through that differently together? Okay. And these are areas where, right, we need to just acknowledge. We commit to show grace to each other because at any point in time we may be at different conclusions in matters of conscience on these issues, but we need to seek to grow, grow in grace together. Okay, not adding to our conscience. What about issues where we need to subtract from our conscience? first one he raises is uh, an issue of should believers, should individuals get tattoos, right? And this, you know, I would say uh, was more of a, an issue that was at top of line for the culture, uh, you know, a couple decades ago, but still, still pressing. Should an individual uh, uh, get a tattoo? And the the author describes growing up in a, in a household where um, it was, it was told him often that it was, uh, it was a sin to get a tattoo and, and Leviticus 19 uh, was referenced, and because of that, that it was a sin to get a tattoo. Uh, but he, he describes where he, you know, understanding, uh, growing in his understanding of God's word and not applying that instance from the old covenant law, uh, I think he, you know, grew rightly to the conclusion that he, he did not need to be burdened about that issue, about whether it was right or wrong, or whether it was wrong for him to get tattoos. Uh, and so he subtracted that from his conscience, not instantaneously, but by growing in theological understanding. But, this is a really good example, he talks about here where he still does not get tattoos, not because his conscience is burdened by it, not because he thinks it's wrong, but because he wants to not limit himself in where he might be able to go from a missional standpoint at some, time, some point in his life. Because he recognizes that there are some cultures, some areas of the world where his ability to share the gospel would be prohibited by him having a tattoo. And so though his conscience is now not burdened by that issue, he chooses as a matter of, as a matter of freedom to, to not, not partake in a sense. And I think that's a, that's a really good example because there's a lot of issues uh, that would fall in that category. Uh, and I think, you know, especially... Uh, with issue of, of alcohol even. Uh, I think a lot, you know, a lot of believers are probably in that camp, and there's a variety of issues and, and uh, a variety of understandings, matters of conscience on that issue. Uh, but I think that's, that's a place where many people find themselves, uh, where would say that not, it's not a matter of theological understanding uh, that they abstain from alcohol. They think we're free to do that in moderation, but choose not to. Uh, as a matter, as an issue of, of wisdom. I think that's a really good example of thinking through some issues where it's not a matter of, of it being wrong to partake, but still choosing not to in clear conscience as, a, as an issue of, 
of wisdom. And I think that's a really good category for us to keep in mind. Another example that he uses is uh, using certain instruments in congregational worship. And when I first read that, I thought he was going to you know, go to uh, those that might be from a Church of Christ background or, or something in that ballpark. But he actually talks about in a missional context in Cambodia. There were many new believers in Cambodia that, as a matter of conscience, could not use uh, these gongs in worship, in singing and, and making music, because those gongs were often associated with pagan practices in Cambodia. And so they felt like they couldn't use them in their own worship. But eventually, over time, in th- growing in theological understanding, they subtracted that burden from their conscience uh, because they, they said, you know, why should we not worship God in this wonderful instrument that he's given us? Why should we let the pagans have that and not us? We can use this instrument to the glory of God. Uh, so there's, there's several other several other issues that he raises here. And uh, just the chapter closes with a list of things that we might need to adjust our conscience about, you know, just to raise all of these. You know, how do, we, how do you treat Sundays? How do you think about listening to secular music? How do you think about capitalism and socialism? Uh, watching particular movies, reading Harry Potter, um, antibiotics or or vaccines or not, public school versus private school. You know, there's all these issues where we might need to adjust our conscience one way or the other uh, by growing in theological understanding. And and we do that in grace uh, together. And it's so important that on these issues of conscience that we are not dogmatic about our positions, but in grace, in love uh, towards others that um, that we seek to glorify God in faith, applying God's will. Uh, together. So it's almost, it's almost 1030. Just these last few minutes, um, I'll open it up. Any, any questions, any things you all want to talk through a little bit more before we wrap up? That's me, I'm sharing. That's good. Yeah, that's good. And that was a, that was a part I overlooked here. Uh, in the area of subtracting conscience, you know, they, they raised the issue of uh, biting your fingernails and grew up in a home where it was told them often, it is wrong to bite your fingernails. It is wrong to, to do that and to act in public in that way. And, you know, we think about growing up and it was like, well, is it, like, is, it, is it a sin to bite my fingernails? Or is it just mom and dad didn't want me to bite my fingernails in public? And this is what they say about those kind of issues. Uh, they say, it's, if we don't distinguish family rules from Bible commands, our children will tend to lump them all into the same category. And it may tempt them to reject all rules later in life instead of simply adjusting their consciences as they get older. And they acknowledge, right? It's, it's almost inevitable that children don't lump those things together, right? That they grow up and make certain issues to be matters of conscience where it was simply mom and dad's preference. Like that's almost inevitable, just growing up in a household together. Uh, but we need to clearly distinguish and to say, you know, this is, this, is, this is our house rule. This is God's rule. And those are, those are two different things. And you have to respect both, but make sure you understand the distinction. Um, and I can just think from my own life. You know, one issue of that was uh, Santa Claus at Christmas, right? You know, I grew up in a household where we, uh, we still talked about Santa and had that as a kid. Um, it wasn't something that was pushed super hard, but that was something that we did in our household and, and did it in a way uh, that was, I think, that was still kept the center of Christmas and the focus on Christ there. But I had other family members that didn't share that conviction, and they chose early on not to, not to talk about Santa, to celebrate Christmas with the focus on Christ and talk about the gifts in a different way. And I can remember as a child, as a, well, I won't say a child, five years ago, just scoffing at them and saying, oh, how, how? foolish of them to not allow their kids to enjoy that part of Christmas. And now I look on back on that now. It's like, well, I, I took that issue of freedom in our family to be, a, to be a rule from God rather than a household issue that we just decided as a family not, or that we decided to partake in. And I just didn't have a category for distinguishing between those two and being gracious to others. Yeah. All right, what else? Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, dive in... Uh, this week, you know, dive into First Corinthians where Paul's talking about these things too. Because Paul, you know, here in Romans 14, Paul says, I am convinced before God that all things are, are clean, uh, speaking about those things. And then, in, uh, but in First Corinthians, um, 
verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 9, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become uh, a stumbling block to the weak. Uh, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother of whose sake Christ died. So, so Paul would say, I can, I can eat this meat to the glory of God, but if I'm sitting next to my brother who does not share that conscience, does not share that position before God, as an issue of freedom, as a priority of the gospel, I will gladly adjust to accommodate uh, so that he will not so that he will not stumble in his own conscience. Because even though I'm convinced it's right and glorifies God for me to enjoy this meat, it is wrong for my brother because he is burdened uh, in that way. So, and that's yeah, that's right. Going back to what we said, an other-centered, uh, gracious conscience is what we uh, what we should seek before God. Yeah. So that's yes. With all of these issues, we got to take Paul's command seriously to make sure that we're doing what we're doing out of faith, out of charity to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and above all, not placing. I think is especially hard for us as Americans, right? Not placing our freedom as the chief issue, but faith and glory to God above all else. Good. And so next week, chapter five, Chris is going to dive in more to that. What do we do when our consciences? conflict uh, with a brother and sister and how do we how do we work through those things together so thank you all so much send all your bad emails to chris about whatever you disagreed with and uh glad to be with you all thank you